Hello, my name is Professor Bill Barring. I've been teaching at uh, Birkbeck College for 15 years now, and I'm really pleased to be doing this video as part of the Birkbeck Inspires series. The reason I'm making this video is that I combine teaching and publication at Birkbeck with practice as a barrister. And in fact, I was practicing full time as a barrister for 15 years uh, before I started becoming an academic at the age of 40 in 1990. So uh, the reason for making this video is that I had some really good news a few days ago. That is that a, I do work at the European Court of Human Rights and uh, a case which I initiated right back in 2007. Uh, there was finally a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights uh, in which my client uh, was fully vindicated in her claim that her husband was murdered by the Russian Secret Services in 2006. And some of you may have heard of this case. It's the case of Alexander Litvinenko. In 2006, he was murdered in London using radioactive poison, polonium, uh, and he was poisoned by putting the uh, radioactive polonium in his tea. And uh, at the time, he was admitted to University College London in terrible pain. It was not discovered what had actually poisoned him until he was on the point of death. Uh, but it was very thoroughly established that uh, the murderers were two Russians and the question for the case was whether Russia could be held to be responsible. The way it works at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is that cases are brought against states, not against individuals. And there are 47 member states of the Council of Europe uh, which covers 850 million people and the uh, citizens or residents or people under the jurisdiction of all of those countries can bring cases against the relevant country <coughs> at the European Court of Human Rights. In this case, uh, Russia, even though Mr. Litvinenko was murdered in London. So how could we prove that it was Russia that was responsible? Well, first of all, uh, this uh, radioactive polonium uh, poison is manufactured in the necessary quantities at a factory in Russia, which is under state control. And we had the evidence of a top uh, physicist in Britain, Professor Norman Dombey, uh, who gave us clear evidence to that effect. So even if we couldn't prove that Vladimir Putin ordered the murder and we didn't have a fly on the wall, uh, what we could prove was that the murder could not have happened without the connivance of the Russian state. And as I say, we started the case in uh, 2007 on behalf of Mr. Litvinenko's widow, Marina Carter. So the case is called Carter against Russia. And uh, the written pleadings in the case, that is the written arguments, were finished in 2011. So why did it take so long? And the reason is that between 2012 and 2014, uh, there was a public inquiry in London uh, headed by a retired judge, Sir Robert Owen, into the circumstances of the death of Alexander Litvinenko. <coughs> First of all, uh, Marina Carter had a inquest, but that inquest could not hear uh, the secret evidence from the British Secret Services. A High Court judge could hear it, in fact, uh, the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, tried to prevent Marina from having a full public inquiry. Uh, but uh, uh, Ben Emerson QC and Maya Sikand, 
who is now also QC, <coughs> took judicial review proceedings against the government, um, against Theresa May, and won. So there was the full public inquiry for two years. And the judge found that Mr. Litvinenko had very probably been murdered by Russian uh, agents. And the European Court of Human Rights uh, is not fast, uh, but it is the highest court in Europe. And what it decides is authoritative. And so between 2014 and a week or so ago, the court considered all of the information and in particular the fact that Russia had absolutely refused to cooperate uh, either with the inquiry or with the case. And on that basis, the court was able to find that Russia had uh, violated Mr. Limbon Mr. Litvinenko's right to life and that his wife Marina Carter had suffered as a result of course and she was awarded 100,000 euros in compensation because she had lost her husband. <coughs> so uh, what this is really about from my point of view is that I'm director of the Masters in Human Rights at uh, Birkbeck I teach um, uh, public international law and human rights to undergraduate students as well. And for me, what really makes this interesting and exciting is the combination of theory and practice. So I'm teaching, I'm writing academic articles and books on these topics. At the same time, I am practicing at the European Court of Human Rights. And indeed, one of the modules, one of the courses <clears throat> which I teach for the Masters is called Taking a Case to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, my students work on a live case uh, at the European Court of Human Rights and they work with the Air Centre Advice on Individual Rights in Europe, uh, which is the top NGO uh, helping people take cases to the European Court of Human Rights. And indeed, they teach two of the seminars. So the students work on a live case. They have a go at drafting. And indeed, more than half of the students taking this module don't have a law background, but they really enjoy getting involved in a real case at Strasbourg. And for me, that is what makes it so exciting. At the same time, at Birkbeck, we pride ourselves on having a critical approach to law. In my case, that means to human rights law. So for my students on this particular module, I'm able to bring my own experience. I've been uh, representing clients at the European Court of Human Rights since 1992, uh, during the 90s, primarily against Turkey on behalf of Kurds. Uh, and since Russia joined the Council of Europe and ratified the European Convention on Human Rights in 1998, many, many cases against Russia, but against other countries as well. <clears throat> so the students have the benefit of my experience of the work of the Air Centre, and they become very familiar with uh, the procedure of starting a case. Um, it's not going to be fast, but what is really important for the people who take complaints to Strasbourg is not that they want money, but that they want the truth of what happened to them. They are victims of violations of human rights. But there are many problems with the system, which we explore with the students. And so the way the module is structured in terms of assessment is that students have to do two bits of drafting for 10% of the final mark each. And then 80% is a critical essay on what on earth is the point of taking a case to the European Court of Human Rights when it takes so long. Uh, not every case takes 14 years, as in the case of Marina Carter, uh, but it is never faster than five or six years. And uh, the compensation is not great. And so, uh, and of course, 
uh, more than 90% of applications to the court are thrown out. So uh, the students have to really consider uh, from all sides and drawing on a range of materials why one should take the trouble to go there. So as a result of what happened last week, I'm going to be able to tell them from my own experience how worthwhile it is, not for me, uh, but for the client whom I represented for all these years. I'm very much open to uh, questions. You will find me on the internet. Uh, my email is easily found. I hope you've enjoyed this and please find out more by visiting the Birkbeck website www.bbk.ac.uk Thanks for watching this video.